We want everything that has breath to praise the Lord. Jenny is going to come and read our first scripture this morning, followed by Val. Our first reading this morning is taken from Psalm 31, beginning at verse 14. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from my enemies and from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. Let me not put to shame, O Lord, for I have cried out to you. But let the wicked be put to shame and lie silent in the grave. Let their lying lips be silenced, for with pride and contempt they speak arrogantly against the righteous. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men and for those who take refuge in you. In the shelter of your presence, you hide them from the intrigues of men. 
In your dwelling, you keep safe. You keep them safe from accusing tongues. Praise be to the Lord, for he showed us his wonderful love to me when I was in a besieged city. In my alarm, I said, I am cut off from your sight. Yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. Love the Lord, all his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but the proud he pays back in full. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is James 1, 1 to 16. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away, even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. This is the word of Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, So let's just pray for Tim as he comes to speak to us this morning. Father, we pray that you would use Tim to speak to our hearts this morning of your will and purpose for our lives. Father, pray that you would um, move by the power of your Holy Spirit upon Tim and upon, upon each one of us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Vanessa. So we're uh, sort of beginning a, not a summer series, but uh, sort of preacher's choice. So everybody who's uh, preaching over the summer has had the opportunity to uh, 
to pick a particular verse or a passage from the Bible that uh, really sort of grips their heart. So I've chosen James chapter 1, verses 1 to 16. Now many commentators or biblical scholars on the book of James uh, really recognise it as a sermon, so that's a good start, isn't it? Uh, and that was written down at, uh, at some point. And the author identifies himself simply as James. So he was probably quite well known to the church at that time. And here's a, quite an amazing thing. Well, I find it quite amazing anyway. Uh, the, this letter was probably written by James, the brother of Jesus, who became a Christian after witnessing the resurrection of his brother. Well, I guess technically he was his half-brother. Same uh, mother, different father, if you get where I'm coming from. Uh, Holy Spirit on the one hand and, and Joseph on the other. But uh, James, the brother of Jesus, that's, uh, I think that's quite amazing, isn't it? We may well, very well be looking at a sermon that was written by Jesus' own brother nearly 2,000 years ago. What an experience James brings then to his writing, growing up as the brother of Jesus. We can only imagine what that was like. And then being a witness to the resurrection. Well, the letter he writes is an extremely practical one about uh, the Christian life. And he begins it by sort of introducing himself, uh, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's quite like uh, St. Paul, who often describes himself as a servant of God too. And the word that we often translate of servant, in fact, as servant, is in fact really slave. We replace it with servant. Uh, but the intention is clear, isn't it? The priority of James's life, as was Paul's, is to serve God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit wholeheartedly in their lives as a slave or a servant. His master for whom he works is the living God and the message of new life that he brought us through Jesus Christ, his son. So James is a servant of that message, a servant of the living God. So who is this uh, letter written to? Well, it's written, as James writes, to the 12 tribes of the dispersion. Now, we may uh, think of that, of the uh, sort of 12 tribes of, uh, of Israel, uh, you know, i.e. the sons of Jacob, you know, Joseph and his amazing technical and dream coat uh, and all that. But actually, it's shorthand for God's dispersed people throughout the world. And as James is clearly a Christian, we can be certain that basically he is writing to the Christian church at that time, dispersed throughout the known world. Oh, that to me sounds pretty much like us in Thorpe Ago with Dishley this morning. Part of the Christian church dispersed throughout the world. I hope you would agree with that. Well, the letter is concerned with various aspects of the Christian life. Our birth, that's our spiritual rebirth, our growth and our development as Christians. And throughout the letter, James will address many aspects of our uh, Christian journey under these three headings of birth, growth, and development. So this afternoon, here's your task, if you've not got too much else on, to read the rest of the book of James, the letter. Uh, it's not very long. I think there's five chapters. Um, and it won't take long, but it is well worth uh, reading. It's a very practical uh, instructions in aspects of the Christian faith. But today, we're just going to look at verses 1 to 16 of the opening chapter. And uh, this opening part is an introduction to three things. Faith and wisdom, poverty and riches, trial and temptation. Faith and wisdom... Poverty and riches, trial and temptation. Well, let's start with faith and wisdom. He writes, My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Could leave the message there this morning, couldn't we really? But uh, are you kidding, James? Are you, are you sure? Is that our first thought when trials uh, come our way? Consider it nothing but joy. 
Who welcomes trials in their lives? Well, we may not uh, welcome trials, but I'm guessing with some confidence, uh, and I've got to know many of us here in uh, Thorpega with Dishley over the last sort of eight or nine months, many of us have had trials or are experiencing trials of some kind. They've been thrust upon us. The truth is, isn't it, this morning, that we can testify that life throws trials at us, whether we want them to or not. They could be illness, they could be financial hardship, they could be the loss of loved ones. They could be personal things like self-doubt, unfulfilled ambitions, the uncertainty perhaps of the very church we call our spiritual home as we grasp and grapple with the Shape by God Together process. Life brings with it many trials of many kinds and it seems to be particularly true at the moment. We may even uh, encounter direct opposition to our Christian faith, perhaps not as stark as our church buildings being razed to the ground, as it happens in many uh, countries uh, around the world, or a restriction on when and where and how we're allowed to meet as the church in China faces. I believe even the Chinese government sort of pays people to inform on their neighbours about their Christian activities. Well, we may not face uh, those trials, but the challenge to our faith is there. It may be more subtle, as people say when we express our faith. How can you believe in God? What about suffering in the world? What about other religions? See, our challenge, whatever it is, is how we respond to life's trials. And for the Christian, the challenge is, knowing that we worship a loving God... How then do we, respond, do we respond to the challenges in life? For we know we're not immune from them. But we also know that God loves us as our Father. This reality of life's troubles and how they affect our life as Christians was addressed, of course, by Jesus himself in the parable of the sower, as he said... As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. So the key for us, and this is what James is addressing, is how we respond through faith to the trials of that life brings us without falling away. If we endure them in faith, what does it produce in us? Is it something positive? It is, James says, it produces endurance. Like uh, if you imagine an athlete training uh, hard, enduring pain and discomfort throughout their training routine. Um, a few years ago, um, uh, the, uh, the British athlete, um, Olympic team was blessed with many, many uh, wonderful world-class rowers, Stephen Redgrave, etc., etc. And uh, they once did a, a, a sort of a behind-the-scenes look at their training routine. And I think it was Matthew Pinsent who described the fact that after a training routine, he's exerted himself so much that he's often sick. He's just absolutely given everything he can. Endurance, like an athlete who trains hard. And then when they step up to the start line, whether that's on a track or on a, on a lake somewhere, they know they've prepared for what is to come and they will win the prize on race day. You see, James says, the testing of our faith produces endurance. For the athlete, a genuine training regime produces the ability to compete in the race. In the same way, the testing of our faith produces a genuine training ground for a faith that endures life's trials. For our faith is not a faith sown on rocky ground that withers. 
Secondly, when through a consistent endurance we face life's troubles, it produces in us, James says, a maturity, a settledness, a completeness to our faith. It leads, he says, simply to a faith that lacks nothing. That's the kind of faith I long for in myself, a faith that lacks nothing. Using another illustration from sport, they often talk about a, a football player perhaps becoming a complete player. A complete player is one that possesses all of the qualities needed for the position they play in. We may think of strength, speed, height, positioning, skill and awareness of the game. So a Christian faith that is complete will include the knowledge of scripture to answer the doubts that the devil, Satan, raises in us. Like Jesus did when tempted by Satan, Satan was saying, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus, of course, not lacking in faith and knowing the scriptures, replied, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. A completeness to our faith includes a wonderful and in-depth knowledge of scripture. So when doubts come, we can just answer back. We live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Also, a complete faith gives us the ability to keep going uh, as a church, as individuals, when the tide of faith seems to be ebbing away in our culture. It helps us to try to keep reaching people with the gospel, to have a faith that declares that Jesus is Lord when life's trials are upon us. A complete faith isn't a passive one that says, well, rubbish things happen. I'm just going to take cover, hide away for a while and accept it. It's an active faith which helps us, enables us to keep serving God when things aren't going well. James then addresses how we can be like that. Someone with a complete faith, lacking nothing. How we can endure, how we can continue to serve, how we can remain faithful. He recognises what we need. We need a large dose of wisdom. And wisdom is not just knowledge. The best way I've uh, heard wisdom described is this. The ability to apply what we know to the problems of life. When knowledge guides our actions, knowledge has passed over to wisdom. So we may know a scripture, a trial or temptation comes and we apply it. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. We may know in theory that God loves us. We may know in theory that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. We may know that God calls us to endure life's trials in faith so that our faith is being perfected. But James is saying to the church then and to us today, you may know this in theory, but do you know how to apply it to your life? How to live it out when reality strikes? This is how you endure. You ask God for wisdom. Because he knows how hard it can be to endure in faith through troubling times, James says, ask for wisdom. You see, James is longing for the people of God to be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. But he's also real about what it is to be a Christian, to be a church member, to live a life where trials are part of it. If you are lacking in wisdom to deal with this, then the answer is relatively simple. Ask God, ask God for wisdom. He gives it generously and ungrudgingly. I love that word, uh, ungrudgingly. God doesn't look at us and say, goodness, they ought to be wise uh, by now. Looking around in the church this morning, I might think, oh, there's quite a few mature Christians here. You ought to be wise by now. You're not having any more wisdom. That's not what God does. He gives wisdom to us continually and ungrudgingly, in spades, if you like. 
All we have to do is ask in prayer. Sounds easy, but what it means is that we have to come humbly before God and say, Lord, I may be a mature Christian, but I don't know everything still. I have limitations. I haven't got an answer to every problem I face, but I know in faith that you can give me wisdom, the knowledge to apply what I do know to cope with my life and my trials is wisdom. Lord, give me wisdom in space. Lord, give me that wisdom. And for those who won't come humbly before God in faith to ask for his wisdom, James says, these are the consequences. You're going to be blown around like waves on the sea. Waves are a, a wonderful example. You just have to picture a Cornish beach maybe when there's a big storm uh, out there and uh, I don't know if James knew about how waves were formed by the sort of the the moon cycles and all of that I'm sure they probably did as they observed it uh, like we do um, but he could see the actions of strong winds on waves can you imagine they're all blown around aren't they they try to break the wind blows them one way uh, and then another Waves don't have control over their own destiny. They're driven by external forces. And if you doubt, James says, you will be like a wave tossed about by life storms. You'll be double-minded. It's the shall I, shan't I, is it? Is it not? Does God really say that? Does God really love me when trouble comes? James says, no, don't be double-minded. Don't be blown around like the waves. Ask for God's wisdom. God may have an unlimited supply of wisdom, but will he give it out to those who are just tossed around by the wind? If we're not fully committed, but if you like, keep a foot open for the world's values, one foot in both camps, hedging our bets, then we're not sincere about wanting to have a spiritual wisdom, a wisdom from God to direct our life. So in essence, it would be wasted on us. No, James says, don't be blown around by the wind. Stand firm and ask God for the wisdom to do so. Well, as this uh, chapter sort of draws uh, to a close, he introduces uh, another point, and it might sort of seem like it pops out of nowhere as he talks about poor and rich Christians. Does it relate at all to what we've been talking about so far? The idea of rejoicing in all circumstances? I think we find it does. Whether we find ourselves uh, rich or poor, and they are contrasting circumstances in life, and both can bring trials. James says, you may be facing trials about being rich or poor. And in fact, he warns us, it seems almost countercultural. he warns us that the rich face a more insidious threat to a committed spirit-filled life of wisdom with God. Elsewhere in scripture, Paul's letter to Timothy, we read that the love of money is the root of all evil. It's often misquoted as money is the root of all evil. James highlights that the rich person faces a much greater danger of giving in to sin because when you're rich, you're concerned about keeping your wealth. And whilst you do, you don't even notice that you're withering away like a flower in the scorching sun. It's uh, something that often, sort of, obviously each of us wrestle with. And uh, something that, as I'm reflecting on, on this, uh, something that sort of amuses me um, quite often. I suppose, I don't know whether amused is the right word, but we'll use it this morning. Something that amuses me is that uh, sometimes people can become so rich that they can't afford to pay taxes in the country of their birth. It seems to be particularly true, particularly true of Formula One drivers who uh, get so rich that they can't possibly live in Britain anymore because they have to pay tax. So they go and live in Monaco or some other tax-free sort of state. So concerned do they seem to be to preserve as much of their wealth 
as possible. That insidiousness of wealth can lead us away from God. And we may be living a life of luxury, but our lives are just withering away like anybody else. No, James says, in both circumstances, let the poor rejoice in the knowledge of their riches with God. Let the rich say, what a wretch I am. It brings both to an equality in God's sight. And it sort of sums up the whole thrust of this opening part of James. In whatever circumstances we find ourselves, we are called to rejoice for this is the true response of the Christian who knows God's love and grace and who is blessed with spiritual wisdom it doesn't mean life will be easy but the peace of God which passes all understanding will be part of that life well at the end of our reading uh, from James he turns uh, not back to the trials that life throws at us externally, but to the ones that we face internally. Our inner battles, uh, sin, the flaws uh, within us, the temptations. And uh, he says, if you're tempted to say that these uh, come from God, uh, they don't. They come from your fallen nature. God is perfect and evil in our lives doesn't originate from him. As was the case with our trials, if we endure temptation, as we endure trials, it produces a complete Christian faith, mature and lacking in nothing. So there is the benefit, a spiritual benefit in enduring trials and temptations, a faith lacking in nothing. You will know God's blessing, God's peace, God's fulfilment as we endure trials and temptations in our life. We will experience a peace, an inner peace that only comes from knowing God. And if we're struggling with that this morning, as I said, the solution is a relatively simple one. Pray to God for the wisdom the spiritual wisdom to overcome the trials and the temptations of life. To endure trials and temptations, to rejoice regardless of our circumstances, will produce a life where we know God's blessings, where we will know and have the sure hope of the crown of life, not blown around by the wind. We will live a fulfilled and enriched life now, but also throughout eternity. Endure and your faith will become mature. Endure and you will know God's blessings. We're called not to blame God when things go wrong, but in wisdom to turn to him for help and guidance. Let's pray for a few moments. Lord, this morning we thank you that we can meet here in peace and freely to worship you. We pray, Lord, that as trials and temptations come our way, you will help us by your Spirit to humbly ask for your wisdom to overcome, to lead us to a faith that lacks nothing so that we may be able to rejoice in all circumstances as the psalm said Lord help us to be strong and to take heart for our faith our hope is in you Amen
Oh, oh. 